family. Morning, Elliot. Uh, thanks for doing this conversation with Brand New. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Lovely, lovely. So uh, allow me to begin at the beginning, as I say. Um, you want to take us through a little bit of your growing up years, your childhood influences? Sure. Um, so I grew up in Oakland, California, um, which is in the San Francisco Bay Area, but it's on the east side of the Bay. So it's a, it's a little, if you've seen pictures, you know, if listeners have seen pictures of San Francisco, um, it's in the same urban area, but it's more like growing up in Brooklyn rather than Manhattan, uh, you know, right. as an example. Um, I, you know, I, I really love Oakland. Um, it's a sort of a microcosm, I think, of a, of a lot of the United States for better and for worse. Um, but it's, uh, you know, a really diverse community, um, a really dynamic, um, it's really dynamic, both in terms of its uh, local economy and, and sort of the, the cultural scene and art scene and food scene that's going on here. Um, and people from, you know, I grew up with people from all over the world living in my neighborhood. Um, and so, uh, you know, I, I really appreciated that. Um, and I actually moved, I lived elsewhere. I lived uh, elsewhere in California and then um, in Taiwan. Um, but uh, about 10 years ago, moved back to Oakland. So it's been a fun sort of uh, circle to, to return here. Um, you know, wh what, what do you think would be most interesting to listeners in terms of the the themes in my bio? Like, do you want to do you want me to explore sort of influences on the writing front, or what what are you most yeah, we'll, curious we'll about? Yeah, we'll come to we'll come to that in terms of uh, you okay. know. So we all have our impressionable age, right, um, and early influences. Sure. You know, I wanted to kind of understand sure, a bit sure. about that. Yeah, yeah, y yeah. Um, so um, I'd say a few things in terms of like. Uh, moments that stick out from that time that still resonate and sort of like echo through a lot of my life and work. Um, one is that uh, I went to this funny, uh, it's about school. So I, my parents sent me to this odd uh, elementary school um, and uh, it was called the, the Waldorf School. It was like a, a specific kind of like educational philosophy um, and part of it, uh, part of the way the school taught is that rather than just having sort of the standard curriculum of, you know, math class and you know, English class and history and all the rest, um, they also taught you like they also had unusual classes. So they had almost like a modern dance class. We took both German and Spanish from first grade on. And they also had a class called handwork. Um, and handwork was you learn knitting and crocheting and sewing, right? Like all like literally working with fabrics and textiles. And um, and so you would work on projects. You would make a hat or a sweater or, you know, stuffed animal when you're really young. And so uh, I was absolutely terrible at handwork. Um, and uh, and the reason was that while we would get the assignment, we'd be given the thread to sew or the yarn to knit with. And then the teacher would read us stories. So, she, you know, while we're, while we're working and knitting, um, she would read us often like Native American mythology or just a really wide range of stories, but she would she would read us these stories and in class everyone else was busily working away listening to the story in the background and i the minute she started reading us a story i would be so in engrossed. absorbed totally engrossed with the story that my hands would stop moving right so <laughs> um so it was always sort of a bit of a joke because you know everyone else would make say uh you know a stuffed animal and they would knit their stuffed animal and my stuffed animal would be like 10% the size of everyone else's stuff. Like I had like a tiny little stuffed animal because I never made any progress because I was so immersed in the tales she was telling. And, um, and that really stuck with me. So like, as I grew, you know, I and learned to read, I would like go and hide in the stacks at the library. Um, and uh, it, so that my parents wouldn't take me home. 
Um, and uh, and that's always been the, the fact that narrative can create this this temporary alternative reality that you can transport yourself into um, has always been something that really fascinated me um, ever since I was, yeah, ever since I was failing at handwork. Um, and and to go along early that, on in life, you uh, realize that multitasking doesn't work. You know? <laughs> yeah, not for me anyway. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I can only do one thing at a time. That's for sure. Um, and then I think, you know, another really, because now I'm thinking about school, um, the next school I went to when I was a little older. So, you know, this would be when I was, uh, let's say, from 10 through 14 years old um i went to a school that had a different um odd educational philosophy and this one was socratic method and so the socratic method is based on you know the ancient greece greek philosopher socrates, socrates. and um and so the as a teach as a style of teaching and learning it's all built around um asking good questions rather than teaching answers. So as an example, in math class, we the teacher would not tell us how a certain new operation worked. Instead, the teacher would present a, pro a math problem or a situation that gives context to the math problem. And then you, all the students would break apart into groups and try to figure out the solution to this puzzle, right? And, right. Um, and you know, often you'd get it wrong um, uh, and like you'd get it wrong in different ways, um, but then you'd get it right. And then your peers are the ones sort of like, dis you, you are discovering the knowledge in this sort of, uh, journey that someone else has laid out for you rather than someone imparting the knowledge to you and uh and i found that to be like that really clicked with me um i loved uh needing like being presented with these these kinds of puzzles and that was true not just in math class but in when we were learning to you know, reading and writing, when we were history and science class, like in all of these different contexts, everything was presented as how can we find interesting questions that uh, tease the, the students or like um, challenge the students to try to develop answers of their own and then coach them through that process rather than to say, this is the right way to answer this question, learn it so that you can repeat it on a test. And um, that really stuck with me too. And that's actually, um, I think uh, it, it's really informed a number of like major life decisions for me where I've always been much more compelled at my curiosity is peaked when I find a question that doesn't have an easy answer. If, if there's a question that has a straightforward answer, even if I'm right about it, I almost immediately am bored by it because now I get it's like over, right? Like the interesting part for me is when you don't know the answer yet and you're working in that sort of space of possibility and of uncertainty, um, if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. In fact, you use a couple of words there, exploration, discovery, curiosity. Uh, what I wanted to kind of wade into the next question was your journey of being a novelist, a writer. Uh, was it um, a journey of exploration and discovery or was it focused and um, structured? Mm. So I, um, maybe this subverts the sort of popular mythology of how people become writers. But for me, I never dreamed of becoming a writer. I, I didn't, it wasn't like a childhood ambition of mine. Um, uh, I feel like, in, if anything, my childhood ambition, or it wasn't even an ambition, what I loved as a child and still do is reading stories. So that was always really clear to me that, I, but like I remain uh, a reader first and a writer second. Um, and um, so the way that I fell into writing was that I was doing something else that, that I love. So 
um, I was uh, uh, I was working for a I had worked for a number of technology startups, um, and you know I started the first one. I was in uh, my last year of college, I think. And um, I was an intern, right? So I was just starting to learn the ropes. And of course, when you're at a small team of people who are all working on a really tough problem and things are moving fast, even if your title is intern, um, you very quickly wind up doing a lot of different stuff and having many different responsibilities. So the, the first company I worked for actually did plasma arc gasification, which is a waste energy technology. So basically it's, you're, you're turning, um, garbage into plasma and then converting that into clean electricity um so that i was i found that experience to be tremendously fun because it was hands-on like you were sort of trying to do something that you think could make an impact you were working with a very small group of people where you really felt like that team like they, they we're all in the same boat we're paddling right. together right um but it was really hard and you know it was just very a very moving experience and so then i worked in a few other um startups and co-founded a company of my own and then was recruited into a venture capital firm where we invested in in startups um uh and so uh you know i was an entrepreneur residence for them so i was basically like you know spinning new bits of science out of university labs and turning them to companies all the way to scaling those companies past post series b when they're more mature businesses and i was really i loved the work it was um you know really intellectually stimulating and um uh challenging and you know you sort of you have you have to learn a lot because there's no other choice it, it fit that like uh hard questions with no easy answers kind of framework right so i i loved it um but at the same time um you know i was always just reading for fun um uh, and uh and i realized that like, basically i had an idea um for a book i wanted to read and usually when i think about a book i want to read I find it and I read it and I move on, right? Like, like that's great. So, um, and so I tried to find that book and wasn't able to. Um, so I sort of like had to say, oh, like I want to read this kind of a book and really searched and searched and couldn't find anything that felt like what I wanted. So and charity began so at home. Sorry? So charity began at home. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, yeah. So, I mean, I really realized I was like, okay, well, I mean, you know, if, if I have this clear idea of like this thing, I would want to exist in the world that does not yet exist. Um, why don't I try to make it? And so I just opened up Microsoft Word and started typing. Like I, like literally I had no, I didn't, uh, like I, that's all I did. I just opened up Microsoft Word. I started typing. That became chapter one. I kept going. Um, and eventually I finished the the manuscript. And um, and then I unexpectedly got a publishing offer on it. And, uh, and then that book turned into a trilogy. And then I was having so much fun um, writing like like I was having so much fun writing the books and I kept having more ideas for books that I wanted to exist um, that I kept going. And so Reaper, which came out in May, was my 10th novel. Um, but uh, basically when I finished that first manuscript and I realized that I was going to publish it, um, that's when I left the, the venture capital fund. I realized like, okay, like that kind of work where you are like, doesn't coexist easily with like doing another big creative project because there's just, you only have 24 hours in a day. Right. So I, I still occasionally, like I still sometimes do commissioned writing projects with um, technology companies. And sometimes I do some advisory work with technology companies that is relevant to, you know, that kind of company building that, that I've worked on for a long time. And, and that's actually a wonderful complement to the kinds of novels I write. So I, I quite enjoy doing both. Uh, you, you spoke about reading and your love and passion for it. You're almost like an unofficial brand ambassador for reading. <laughs> I, right. I, I'm know, happy to take that. I'm, I'm not yeah, happy to wear that. Yeah, <laughs> you know, it's a, it's a coveted title, so congratulations. Uh, do you think, do you think amidst all the distractions that we have, uh, mm. reading is a lost art? Hmm. 
I don't know. I mean, that's a great question, but it's a question I am somewhat suspicious of, and I'll explain why. Um, when you, so uh, media, like as a cat, like how we share and tell and consume stories, basically how we, how we right. tell stories to each other as humans um, uh, has, has changed a lot in the course of my lifetime, but it, you know, it has changed more in the past few hundred years than in the, in the previous few thousand. Right? right. So, you know, you look at the printing press and how that completely shifted the information architecture of, of civilization. Right. Um, right. And had all these cascading consequent, you know, like the, like it led to war and many of all these other things. Um, and, and it took probably a couple centuries for that to fully play out. I think we're like, well, actually, no, that's skipping ahead a lot. So then you get to like radio and, and television and broadcast media, um, which have a very different dynamic than the printing press, right? Like if you have like, uh, 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 you know, broadcast for network television, it was, th there are only a few, few channels on the spectrum. So it's an incredibly centralized kind of uh, way to create, produce, distribute media where a very, very few people like decide what's on TV and everyone else just watches it. Right. And the same logic applies to radio um, and to, to meant, you know, to a lot of the sort of middle of the 20th century. Almost um, one dimensional. Yeah, exactly. And then um, the internet, well, you know, even cable TV started to break that mold, right? It, it, uh, it suddenly you had a thousand channels instead of just three. Um, and, and so that really changed the dynamics around how we, what TV meant. Um, and the internet uh, has done that again, probably more profoundly than, you know, I guess if you wanted to compare the internet to that, I think you'd probably have to compare it to like broadcast media in general. Um, or the printing press in terms of that kind of an impact. And we're right at the beginning. So I think that like, whether you pay attention to people who are like techno optimists or who are super pessimistic, right? Who do doomsayers about what the internet means for culture and all that. Um, like, just remember, no one actually knows, right? Like we're right at the beginning. Not only is it that, uh, not only is it inherently unpredictable, but it's also uh, malleable, like what, what we decide to do with it um, is just as important as like what the technology itself is capable of. Um, and uh, when I look at that, it, like zoomed out view, I am not at all worried about the novel as a form or like the book as a form. And that's really because if you look over the past few centuries, literally every decade, like in uh, authoritative people have made compelling arguments about like the death of the book, right? Like, oh, now we have radio. Why would anyone ever read again? Oh, now we have television. Why would anyone ever read? Oh, now we have color television. You know, like it, uh, it always continues. And I think that, um, uh, and so I'm not at all worried that people are have stopped reading. And actually, if you look at like book sales, which is not the same as reading. So like it, you have to be careful with it as a proxy. But um, book sales have gone up, right, right? Like since the Internet started, book sales have continuously gone up. Like they're stronger in the past few years than they were in the previous few years. So there has never been a drop off in people actually buying books. Of course, you can't. I mean, you can't spy on people to know if they're reading them. And we all know sometimes we buy a book and it just sits on the shelf. Um, but um, I, I think that um, that what makes books special still makes them special. And to me, what makes a book special, whether it's fiction or nonfiction, what makes it special as a form of media, right? That makes it dis really different from TikTok or Twitter or uh, cable news or uh, you know, or HBO, right? Like what makes it really different is that it's meant to be, it's complete, right? If you write a newsletter or a newspaper column or something like that, um, you're participating in an infinite, in a feed, a big feed that's going on forever. It, that is more similar to Twitter, 
right? right. Um, but with a book, like a book is basically a self-contained little pocket universe, right? Like when you go into a book, if it's a book about an idea, like if the book doesn't fully explain the idea and give appropriate context, then it is not a successful book, right? Um, if a book is about a story, like a novel, like a novel that I write, if it doesn't tell the whole story, it's not a successful book, right? Which is really different from the piecemeal kind of uh, aggregated mosaics and feeds that we experience all the time on the internet. And so I think that's part of why books actually are so resilient is that they are very different from what the internet is good at. They're good at something else. And so because of that, they complement it well rather than being easily replaced by it. Um, and I find that really sort of fascinating at like in terms of thinking about media and publishing in addition to participating in it as a writer and a reader. Yeah, I think two things here, Elliot, you know, um, just uh, my interpretation. One is uh, we moved on to what we are calling it a very prosumer world, wherein uh, once upon a time, media consumers are also now creators mm. and curators. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, that is one aspect mm -hmm. of it. And you also look at the other challenge, as you mentioned, you talked about Twitter. How do you tell a compelling story in 140 characters? Right, you, you don't. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. You know, so yeah. you obviously. So yeah. I mean, I, I'm glad that you actually validate the option that you know. I mean, uh, the book is here to stay. And in fact, I'm a big mm. fan of print media per se. And I've been a publisher. Um, that's uh, when I started my career as a publisher. So mm. you know, I I don't want print media to kind of uh, be written a premature obituary. I think it's mm. the quality of the compelling content that you articulate and disseminate. Uh, that mm -hmm. will determine, uh, you know, uh, whether you stay or whether you not stay. So you have classic examples of the New York Times and the Fast Company and the Wires and uh, Guardians of the World, which are actually using technology and digital to augment their print uh, mm -hmm. platforms as well. You know, so I think mm -hmm. I'm glad that you be resonate on that. Front, that mm -hmm. you know, books are here to stay, print is here to stay. Uh, 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 let me segue into the next question that I have. You've written ten books so far. Uh, mm -hmm. Reaper being your 10th, right? Yes. Yeah. So, you know, and each of them, um, you know, is there a particular trigger point or an aha moment that says, okay, this is mm. book worthy? Is it book material? You know, I mean, how does it actually kind of come together for you? Yeah, everyone is different. Um, so, uh, you know, for my first novel, I sort of described the fact that I had this like simmering idea for a book I wanted to read um, uh, with, you know, uh, I, so the book before Reaper was called Veil. Vale, and that actually had like a very clear aha moment, which was unusual. I was actually listening to a podcast. Um, it was Tyler Cohen's podcast and he was interviewing Charles C. Mann, who's a, a, a really thought-provoking historian who's written many uh, like books that have changed how people look at world history. And um, Charles was describing research into what's called solar geoengineering, which um, it, it, it's a real piece of, uh, like a real research area among climate change scientists where um, in uh, in order to offset the uh, worst impacts of increasing global temperature, uh, some scientists are investigating the possibility of flying planes into the stratosphere and dumping neutral dust to literally dim the sun and um, you know allow just a little bit less energy in, so global temperature falls um, and. Uh, and I was listening to this and I was like, that is crazy. <laughs> it's like, well, like, like that, like the, if you, if, if you start thinking about it, like the um, political implications of that, the economic implications of that, let alone the environmental implications and all the unintended consequences that could result, like it's just, it's such a crazy scenario to envision. And yet, like if the alternative is, in action, like that also has all of these cascading consequences. So I was like, oh, wow, like, there is 
so there are so many questions here. This is such a rich uh, thought experiment. This deserves a novel. Like I need to write a novel about this. And so uh, just listening to that. Oh, and another like key aspect of this is both that um, there's uh, there's evidence that like no scientist doubts that it will work. They just worry about uh, what else it could do. The, and the reason why no, no one doubts it will work is that this happens every time a major volcano explodes. It spews a bunch of ash into the stratosphere and global te temperature goes down for the next few years. It happened in Iceland um, during the 17th century. And um, that actually many historians believe that the global cooling and bad harvests that resulted from that caused the French Revolution, right? So you have these like big, like cascading like effects from that. And I was like, oh, this is a book. And, and so right from that moment, listening to a podcast episode, I knew there was a novel there. Um, so that was like a very dramatic example. Rarely for me, like that's one novel out of 10, rarely have it has it been that dramatic much more often it's that um i just start noticing interesting things or having weird ideas and then i start mashing them up right like putting them all to weave like thinking um or uh it, you know if, if any of your listeners listen to electronic music right like part of the sort of wonderful appeal of electronic music is that it's so easy to loop in other artists work right so you can like loop in um you know uh, a vocal that was recorded by a jazz singer in the 1940s and then layer that on top of synth and that you know you can and then bring in a you know something from beethoven <laughs> right like you can do all of these different things and put them together allowing you to take things that are familiar and right. then remix them into something that's surprising and I love that. Like, that's, that's called the I, creative I curve. To do with the Reaper. I'm sorry? That's called the creative curve. Alan Gannett calls it the creative curve. Ah, yeah. L layering the novel on top of the familiar. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So I was going to ask you about Reaper. So what was the, the, the trigger for, Tria, for Reaper? You know? Yeah. So with Reaper, it was, I mean, it's actually very relevant that we're talking, we're, we're talking about creativity as remixing. And um, the reason is that, uh, you know, when I was work, when I was trying to think about Reaper, um, the, I had all of these different, I had four or five different ideas um, that I, that I thought were promising, um, but I didn't have them fully fleshed out into what could be, you know, like novels of their own, if that makes sense. Um, and so I, I was thinking about them and I was like, hmm, are these, do I have ideas for three different novels here? And I should start like developing them as their own separate ideas um or um do i or or is it something else does it need to be five novels do i just pick one of them and run with it um and then i remembered how much i enjoyed david mitchell's novel cloud atlas i don't know if you've read it but um no, i've not read it i've heard about it i've not read it it's i mean it's one of my favorite books um and one of the things that's so unique about it um is that it uh, it has a very distinctive structure. So it has, I can't remember how many, but a number of different stories um, that that are actually spread out across different centuries, like different in, main, different characters. And each story feels independent. And then everything like, lo like starts to lock in and it's sort of like a matryoshka doll of a narrative structure where the farther you get in the book, the more you start realizing all of these weird connections between them. And, um, and I loved that. And then I also read a book called Galapagos by uh, Kurt Vonnegut. Um, and it also had this like really wild free ranging um, structure, many different characters, all, like tons of different big ideas that were all just like in this, one story and it was just sort of like exploding with them and i loved that and so i, as I can a reader, see that I influence like, I in reaper. 
Yeah, exactly. I can see that in plenty yeah. of people. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. So, I mean, I basically thought, well, I have like, you know, ideas, like at least three to five novels worth of ideas here. What would happen if I, you know, wove all of them into a single story? Um, and, and like, I won't lie, it was a real challenge. Um, Reaper was the hardest, no, like the most difficult creative process for any novel I've written. Um, but I'm really proud of how it came together. It's been really fun. Uh, it yeah, was really... It gives uh, the reader agile and alert. So I can imagine the kind of you know, thought and vision that has gone into it mm. as well. You know? You, mm -hmm. you, there is, you, you, it cannot be just a casual kind. You know, it has to be. You have to be really immersed in it. You know, because I, I can yeah. see the novelist and the writer in it having put so much of thought and vision into it. You know, it's not an easy. It's not a straightforward piece of uh, novel writing, I guess. You know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, no. Then, precisely. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. You know, writing given a new imaginary, I guess. You know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Absolutely. So, you know, uh, moving on, you know, in a, you mentioned somewhere that in an age of digital abundance, uh, quality is a new scarcity. Mm. Uh, uh, you, would you want to elaborate on that? We live in immersed in all yeah. of these infinite feeds, right? Like everywhere. You were sort of alluding to this when we were talking about what reading means right. in 2022. And, um, and, uh, the, one of the most beautiful and powerful things about the internet specifically as a new medium is that, as you said, it, it allows everyone to create everyone to publish. It makes culture participatory, um, again, because culture always used to be participant, right? When you had no um broadcast media it. when you had no what you had no say in it actually you... yeah you had no say yeah yeah well but it was also like if you know if you lived in a village if you wanted music you made the music you made right? the music. like that <laughs> like that so like like in many ways like art and cultural products yeah. like used to be very participatory and then with with new technology and new forms of media um, we actually made them less participatory. Like you could just like listen to music made by people who spend their entire lives only making music rather than you and your friends doing it in your off time. Right. So, uh, so, you know, that was uh, really uh, that had wonderful pros. Like we got great music and it also had cons in the sense that like fewer people were really involved in trying to master the creation of music. Um, and now that pendulum has swung back. So now, you know, like if you want to publish a book, like you can write and publish that book without an agent, without a publisher, you can do it directly online. And that doesn't just mean like on Kindle, it means like you can do it uh, hardcover, audiobook, like any of the things you want. Right. Um, and I myself have occasionally worked with publishers and also published my own books. Um, uh, and I've enjoyed both. Uh, and so, you know, there's this and that isn't just true of books. The same is true if you want to make movies. The same is true if you want to make music. The same is true if you want to write essays or paint there we just now have this shared system where we can all contribute the products of our creative effort and labor for others to enjoy but the flip side of that is that once everybody gets to participate there's a lot to enjoy <laughs> right there's far more to enjoy there are far more books published every year than you could read in a lifetime there's far more music made every year than you could listen to in a lifetime there are far more movies you know like etc cetera, etc cetera, in every form of art and because of that um, because we live in this age of abundance it means that um, like you need to find what you like 
And one way to find what you like is just to listen to your, you know, spot auto-generated Spotify weekly playlist, right? Like algorithms can help. Like, you know, sometimes Netflix suggests something that you actually like. <laughs> um, but, you <laughs> know, at least place, speaking yeah. for myself, it's <laughs> sort of like it's not as common as I would hope. Um, and so, uh, so I think that, um, you know, the, the dynamics of, of, um, of finding the right thing for you right now, that's actually really hard to do today in this world where everything is available all the time. And so what that means is people who devote time, effort, intention, and attention to trying to point to things they love and to uh, provide the context required for you to figure out if it's the right thing for you, that that curation is actually invaluable. It's actually much more valuable today than it ever has been before, because before there was never so much abundance to choose from. And so um, I think that's actually really a vital opportunity and cultural service and way to sort of participate and to, to help others. And so, uh, you know, one thing that I do is, is I have a, you know, I write novels, but I also, I have a newsletter that I send out every month and the newsletter is all structured around like every month I, I point to three books I love that, you know, with the idea that if you've read my books, you might share my taste. And so you might appreciate knowing what I'm reading and what you might, you know, that might be interesting to you. It might be the right next book for you. And so um, that's a really, that that's one way that I try to pay that forward to try to, to offer that curation in the world of saying, I read a lot of books. Um, so why don't I let you know when I read something that really resonated with me that I think you might like too, just like I would tell a friend over a coffee. Right. Absolutely. Uh, still, while remaining on the topic of books, uh, what I've noticed is your books, whether it is Neon Fever Dream, Reaper, um, Exit Strategy, Breach, Cumulus, uh, all of them have very unusual titles. Hmm. Okay, um, I'm sure there is a thought behind it. Uh, I'd like to know the story behind it. Yeah, um, you know, each title sort of happened differently. So, for example, for the for the the book I described about geoengineering, it's called Veil, vale, and yeah. I went through a bunch of different titles like veil vale was not its working title um and uh but eventually landed on it and it felt right um so well whereas, done that. yeah thank you um reaper was similar i we i actually um went through four or five titles um before landing on reaper uh but like with borderless for example i actually knew the title before i wrote the book wow so yeah, and, and that was actually sort of a fun creative exercise because having the title there, knowing this is the title, um, actually provided a bit of an anchor as I was working on the book. It was like, okay, the book needs to match. You know, the book needs, if the title is a promise, the, God the story needs to fulfill it. Right. And so that that was actually a really interesting experience. But but yeah, very often um, the titles come from different places. There are some obvious things that, um, I mean, you are a publisher, so you know this, but listeners might find it interesting. Um, you know, when you're naming a book, there are a number of things you want to pay attention to. Like, for example, you wouldn't want to name the book the same title as a similar book because that would be confusing, right? Like... Uh, you 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 don't want to name the book the same thing as like another like a movie that isn't a book that could also be confused you know there are just these like f funny sort of uh, constraints that you need to think through when you're deciding on the title of a book and I always try to find I'm always seeking to find something that 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 feels like it does make a promise 
that feels like it does uh, peak uh, your in that that might when you when you see that you want to know more, right? That's intriguing, but not intriguing in the sense of um, like clickbait is very intriguing, right? It's like that's literally the point of it. Um, but the reason we call it clickbait, the reason it feels dishonest is because when you click through the promise isn't fulfilled right so like it, if it did fulfill its like promise it wouldn't be clickbait it would be a great article um and so i'm always that's what i'm you want to try to find something that really speaks to the spirit of the story that feels like it's um really connected to the inner um, the heart of what that narrative is trying to grapple with. And the same is true for the cover. So you're really trying to create, I like to think of them, do you know those like art deco travel posters? So that, you know, there's these beautiful artistic illustrations of like, <laughs> visit the South Pacific or whatever. Um, and I've always thought of book covers in that sense, like it is a travel poster, like the title and the cover together are a travel poster to to this imagined world right to this imagined place to this imagined experience and so you beyond want the, it to the... yeah exactly so you want that like that's the vibe i'm going for with with the titles and the covers um, my uh, our readers and listeners would be interested in knowing a bit about uh, two things so your award-winning uh, website the true blue mm. And also about uh, machine learning precedent. Okay. Uh, if you want to kind of share a bit about that. Sure. Um, True Blue uh, was a short story. I wrote a short story um, called True Blue. And if you go, I think it's truebluestory.com. You can check it out. Um, okay. But uh, uh, what was, I didn't want to publish it just as a straight text short story um and so i uh partnered with a web designer and an illustrator and um, we raised a grant and developed the story into a custom engineered website and what we wanted to what we wanted to do a few things with the site. First of all, sort of like we were talking about before about these new forms of media, we wanted to say, okay, like, what would it be like if you, rather than, you know, where do you read stories online? Often on a blog or on, you know, on a news site or something like that, um, or on Kindle, right? Um, all of those have really strict constraints and they have really different incentives like a news site is either trying to optimize for subscription revenue or ad revenue and so the website is designed to do that and then the stories are just like the things to get you there right um and you know on kindle it's made to go onto a separate device it's like very strict code requirements right they're just these are very formal shapes that you need to fill and yet the open web with like is a very uh malleable uh medium it's like working with clay you can make it into any shape you want and so we we sat down and we were like what if we treated a website like clay and we tried to create an entire custom engineered site for the sole purpose of telling a single story, right? That's it. That's the whole point. So why don't we try to use what the internet does well to advance the narrative? So here's an example. So um, our illustrator was working in both digital and physical media we would bring in, you know, then uh, the art, my designer and developer would like take all of the material she was providing and then like turn it into material for the site, both the explicit illustrations, but also textures and stuff like that often come from the physical paper she was working on. Um, and, uh, and so if you look at the site and you scroll down and read it, like, <laughs> 
hopefully you'll enjoy the story. And you might just look at it and be like, okay, this feels like when I'm uh, on one of a specially produced New York Times special report where they do a bunch of graphic design with the text. And like, that's true. Like that would be easy to, to think that. And yeah, we did some things that took it even further. So here's a clear example. There's one illustration that's uh, a city street and there are a bunch of people on it and there's some action happening. Um, well, you know, when you look at that on a big desktop monitor, it's really, you have a lot of space and it's like really wide, right? So you, you get to see this whole big scene, but if, if you look at it on an iPad or even on your phone, right? Like there's way less space. Well, you know, if you just shrink the image, you won't get any of the narrative content from it because it's too small. Right. And so usually what websites do is they just rather than just straight up shrinking the image, they would like cut off certain parts of the image. So you don't see the edges of the street. You just see the middle. But the problem with that is that while it's easy to accomplish in terms of web design, like you lose the point, like the image yeah, isn't telling the story it's meant to tell. And so what we actually did is made individual images for every size where the characters would reconfigure themselves so that um, as if you were going from a big screen to a small screen, all it still looks amazing. And every screen all of the size. exactly all of the action, all of the important con the narrative content of the image is still powerful and compelling. Compelling. And so we called that narrative responsive design and we wound up winning a web design award for this project mm -hmm. um, because of that. Um, so, yeah. And if you if you read the story, so first of all, I hope you enjoy the story. And at the bottom, there's a link where I wrote up the whole creative process us explaining this and showing behind the scenes like what we were doing and why and it, it's sort of fun so i bet your your listeners might appreciate it lovely 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 which is the role that you actually relish most you know writer strategist thinker speaker <laughs> um which is a natural calling for you you know yeah um Okay, so you know how um, when you go into a bookstore, there are, uh, there's like the history section, the science fiction section, the fantasy fiction, section, yeah, yeah. architecture, all this stuff, right? Um, so one thing that's really interesting about genre, about these categories that we put stories into, um, is that... Uh, is that they're super useful for like finding what you want, right? Like that's, I mean, that's why the bookstore <laughs> structures itself that way, right? It's like, oh, okay, you want a mystery novel? Like go to that shelf, right? Um, so they're really, really helpful for readers to find what they want. Um, but I find for myself as a writer, I don't think about genre at all as I'm telling a story. Right. So for me, the I'm just following my curiosity when I'm writing a book. The only time I think about genre is after the book is written and we're going to publish it and we have to communicate with other people how they should interpret this book. What context should they think about it in? And often that's challenging for me because reaper could be in the science fiction section but it could also be in the thriller section it could also be in the general fiction section right like it's sort of you know the, and like why put it into it, a box this, right yeah well i mean well like in, that's true in a certain sense and like the artist part of me wants to say yeah get rid of all the boxes but then like the reader part of me is like well those boxes are really helpful Right. Like I want to know, like, I, like I don't want to uh, need to search through architecture books to find a murder mystery. Right. right. Um, so I, I appreciate both. Um, but as a writer, when I'm working on a new project, 
like genre is not meaningful to me at all until the very end. And the same is true for me in what you just asked. So you asked, you know, where do I find my true calling or something like that? When it, is it writing the novels? Is it, uh, uh, you know, it, you know, it, you know, it, <laughs> helping people build companies or, or, or yeah, or giving talks every once in a while. Um, and, uh, I don't think about it that way. Um, to me, it's not that I have different like identities, like if I was playing a role playing game and I had different characters and sometimes I get to do one and sometimes I get to the other, um, for my subjective experience is about, um, uh, uh, realizing that I have an idea that I want to exist in the world and then working to make that real and working to help the right people discover and benefit from it and, and helping others to do the same. So I really enjoy like working on Reaper. It was an idea I had to to put out into the world um, that I want the right people to benefit from. And I hope it inspires other people to tell their own stories, right? Um, I hope that this interview with you, um, you know, you, you are doing the work of a curator. You are bringing, you are, create, you are creating a space for conversation where people can bring in these stories and ideas to help other people develop their own stories and ideas. And so for me, they actually feel monolithic. They feel of a piece rather than being separate things. They actually just feel like this is a part of being a writer, right? Or the, or whatever, however, whatever mixture you want to put it in. Right. Um, right. Yeah. So I don't know if that uh, answers. Yeah, your I question, think you know it's a very it's very unique response. <laughs> actually, it's a very unique response and very, I would say, um, as they say, purposefully provocative. Mm. You know, uh, I think, you know, it's um, uh, very, very well put through, very well put through. Uh, this has been a fascinating conversation, Elliot. Uh, before I conclude, I wanted to ask you one last thing. Wh who are the people and which are some of the books that have really, really kind of inspired you, you know, motivated you? You know, do you want to kind of talk about them? Well, we wouldn't be having this conversation if it weren't for Seth Godin. Yeah. Um, and uh, Seth is just uh, a brilliant writer, an amazing teacher and, and human being. And um, I've learned a tremendous amount from him, um, both from, I mean, he's written many wonderful books. Um, and if your listeners are unfamiliar with his work, one of my, if you enjoyed this conversation, um, one of my favorites of his books is also, I think one of the, ones that isn't as well known um called the dip and uh if you're if you do creative work and you're trying to put it out into the world like i highly recommend it um i Show found it ship out yeah and um and yeah the dip uh you know I, I anyway that that book made a big impression on me and in addition to that i would also uh recommend subscribing to seth's blog i mean it's one of the I mean, for a long time, it was the most popular blog on the internet. I don't know if it still holds the crown, no, but it's I, very I, popular. I get it. I, I know. I'm just um, completely, you know, I mean, bewildered by the the velocity, the quality, the you know, the ferocity with which he actually kind of produces yeah. such high quality stuff. Incredible, you know. I oh. mean, and of course, Akimbo, all yeah. the NBA, the kind of stuff that he does actually, yeah, very, yeah. very, very inspiring. Um. So yeah. So that's uh like. I think that's a great place to start. Um, I also read a, uh, let me find the title really quick. Um, but I, I read a, a novel I absolutely loved um, recently that I think listeners would really enjoy. Uh, okay. It's called Tomorrow and Tomorrow and Tomorrow by Gabriel Zevin. And this, it, I just fell in love with this novel right from the get-go. So it's about um, two game designers um, and um, and they and about their relationship with you. They, they're childhood friends and sort of 
go through a bunch of like ups and downs in terms of their relationship, but the story follows them making um, computer games together over the course of sort of the birth of the games industry, more or less. And the the novel is one of these totally immersive adventures. So it is just super fun to read. So first of all, you should just read it because it's a great story. But once you're reading that great story, you're going to realize that it has so much depth. There are so many ideas about what it means to to be in a creative partnership with someone over time um, and what it means to build things together uh, and and how that impacts all the other facets of your life and um, and it does that more beautifully than any novel I've ever read and so I think that if you know if you listen to this, conversation clearly you're interested in creativity clearly you're interested in probably making things of your own and putting them out into the world and doing that with other people for other people for people you care about so that you can make things you're proud of and share it with them and i think that this novel does uh, accesses so much truth about what that means and what that feels like um, that uh, that you'll you'll just absolutely love it. Definitely recommended, and I'm going to be actually looking at it and buying it soon. Thank you so much, uh, Elliot. It was wonderful talking to you, picking up the power of imagination, you know, uh, that you're bringing into the world. And thank you for doing your work. Uh, all the very best for all your future projects, and we'll stay in touch. Thank you so much. Sounds good. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye.